Hello, everybody, and welcome to this week's edition of In Conversation. Um, it's a great pleasure to be joined today um, by Simon Strange, academic musician and the author of Intellect's forthcoming Blank Canvas, Art School Creativity from Punk to New Wave. Simon, welcome to the show. It's fantastic Hi, to have you. Thank you. Um, thanks for joining us today. Where are you? Uh, where are you joining us from? I am joining you from not so sunny, quite dark Devon. Um, yes, South Coast is wild, windy. Um, you might hear all kinds of noises behind me, but that's yeah, it's quite atmospheric. But as as well as a as an academic and a writer, you're a musician, um, yeah. producer, and a photographer. Yeah. So a, a, a real creative. But um, do you do you teach? Are you based at an institution as well? Yeah, I'm based at um, Bath Spa University. I, I teach at a few universities, but Bath Spa is my kind of home in lots of ways. I've been there for years in different ways. Um, I work in a research centre, but I work across music, art, literature, all kinds of areas, really. I'm a, I'm a research programme manager, but I'm also a lecturer, um, postdoctoral researcher, academic for hire. I did a session with Bournemouth <laughs> University today, so... <laughs> Yeah, I quite yeah, I like I like having a kind of uh I think it's being a musician and a producer has um helped me towards this kind of portfolio career as an academic. And obviously being able to work online is really handy as well. So I can kind of work for a few places, which is great. So what what came first for you? Was it was it music or just just being creative in general? I think music, I mean, I, I think the first thing I did, but I was, to be honest, actually photography and music together at the same time with a bit of sport, but um, we won't go back. But um, it's, yeah, so it was um, those together. I was, uh, my parents are classical musicians. So I was brought up, I'm a trombone player and a pianist and a producer. So I was just brought up across all kinds of music. So I was brought up with my parents across like classical music, jazz mm. and stuff like that. But I was born into like, I was born at the end of the 60s. So I kind of had that whole punk, post-punk, new wave scene as my early teenage years. So I think I feel very lucky to be part of that kind of scene at that kind of age, really, I think. That's very cool. So you're kind of a product of your environment, but quite different environments um, in a sense. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, obviously a lot of cultural upheaval um so yeah so it sounds it sounds like your research and a lot of your interests have come out of that background so that's kind of that's yeah. kind of kind of cool yeah, um definitely and what about teaching do you is there anything that you sort of regularly teach yeah i mean i teach god i, I mean i teach music um cultural studies in music at bath spa um mm -hmm. but i i teach around a range of academic stuff really a lot of research a lot of writing a lot of yeah research skills i train uh, i train researchers as well so that's mm -hmm. that's the main sort of things i teach i used to be a trombone teacher and a teach production as well but wow okay I, you know well that's that must be interesting because bath spa has yeah. got like quite a, a a history and lineage of being for like music tech as well doesn't it yeah. and they have because I, I i remember like friends yeah. of mine because i was from i'm from devon um okay. and obviously intellect's based in in bristol so we we do work yeah. a lot with bath spa and I do always remember that. So, how yeah, how's that? Is it is it quite an interesting mix at the university then between more of your traditional core academic subjects and then more of a practical, practice led application of them? Yeah, yeah. I mean, the creative music technology course is amazing. That's it's loads of producers in the Bristol scene have come and London scene have come through that course. Cool. So yeah, I know so many producers in that course. But so that's the sort of techie side. We got the um, commercial music is the sort of pop music, the bands and all that kind of side. Then there's the classical music side. So they cross all those different areas. They're very strong about music business and okay. practical real world experience at Bath Spa. Well, and, and Southwest, of course, you know, we should give it its props. It's it, it really is yeah. quite a musical giant you know, on the global stage, um, yeah. considering, yeah. you know, our rural sticks. Um, but it's such an interesting kind of like mix, uh, mm -hmm. different cultures and different communities uh, that have obviously yeah born some amazing musical scenes and genres um so yeah so yeah never never uh the southwest is definitely a, a cool place if you're interested in music yeah 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 definitely definitely 
Mm. Well, let's talk a bit more about your research um, yeah. in general. But I, I just want to pick up some things I kind of read on your website and 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 know from discussing with you as well. Uh, I know you, I know Brian Eno is a bit of a you know has a, had an impact on you and and mega producer, of course, you can would. Um, and I like this this quote that you pull: "Simplicity is where the magic occurs." And I know that minimalism is a feature that runs across your work. Mm. I can see it in the photography that you have yeah. produced. Uh, I know it from your writing style, um, and 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 of course from other aspects of the work. So, can you just tell us a little bit about that? What is it that sort of intrigues you about simplicity and minimalism? Why do you find that to be a really creative space? Yeah, I think I've always I'm listening to Arvo Park. So, Arvo Park, classical composer, he was very, yeah. very much a kind of threw everything into the mix kind of composer, but then had a like enlightenment day and he kind of took everything away. And, you know, I love Arvo Park's work from that from a very young age. John Cage as well. <clears throat> I talk about John Cage in the book, but he yeah. informed a lot of those minimalist ideas. And it's I think it's having the space in music. I think learning that as a musician and a producer, that the the gaps and the spaces in the music have as much power as the actual notes and the, the content itself. So I think I found as when I became a producer from the 80s onwards, and in a, in a lot of that 80s music, actually, is a lot of it is about reverb, delays, space, hits, and about there was a massive impact in that. So I think for me, there was it's the impact and it also gives the space for the listener to kind of to get involved in it so i think that was a that was maybe a quote from either eno or gavin bryce in the book about kind of letting the listener kind of be involved in the music because of the space created by minimalism um yeah my photography is very very minimalist my idea is to do minimalist landscapes um like I say production taking things out I, I work i'm an electronic producer and i take lots of the sounds out of my work at the moment to remix them but really strip back everything it's interesting you said about my writing as well because that's maybe that's maybe just down to doing a phd in editing and just kind of really yeah yeah i think it's just that's uh, being an academic as well probably being an academic being a writer is that you kind of want to get to the point and i sometimes find it hard reading fiction work because i find like they're just really talking around it and for me it's like you know get to the point well to be honest to be honest simon i've got to say as a as someone who also works in editorial as well as marketing yeah, yeah. not that many academics do want to get to the point in the clearest most minimal way um, <laughs> that's true, that's, okay. that's, yeah. for, for those people who don't think necessarily publishers still have a, an important place um i tell you there would be a lot of there would be a big mess out there if if, if, if there were no editors uh, assisting um, yeah fair point fair point definitely yeah. Well, in, in it, well, in addition to this idea of minimalism, I, I know that you know, this notion of the blank canvas, mm. which, of course, is the title of the book as well. And that's yeah. something that I know that you, you refer to. What yeah. do you what do you sort of mean by that as a term and, and how do you yeah. utilize it? What, how does that influence you? Yeah, blank canvas is it's the, the concept came to me a few years ago. It, you know, obviously, it's based around those minimalist ideas, but it's also at the Bauhaus at the start of the 20th century. It was, the, it was formed then in the, this idea about kind of getting rid of um, something called unlearning, the idea about getting rid of things that maybe informed art, often through your teens or through that kind of period in, in artists' life or people's lives. Whereas as a child, the idea of child art or the idea that you're kind of unfettered by any external things when you're younger, so, you know, that joy of childhood, that joy of kind of really not in a way, not knowing what's going on, which I can't obviously punk. Punk called itself the blank gener. I mean, in this, in, the, in New York, it was like the blank generation, Richard Hell's blank generation. You know, it's kind of like a year zero for music in a way, like John Cage called himself. And I think it's that idea about kind of like starting from a new place <laughs> with a childlike abandon, with a kind of attitude that's not, you know, taking in too much, it's not thinking too much, I suppose. It's a bit more kind of spontaneous, a bit more offhand. So yeah, that's that's really, and for me, from that space, that idea of simplicity from, um, 
I mean, a lot of the early, some early paintings from Rauschenberg um, were just white canvases and Mal uh, Mal uh, Kazimir Malkovich was black, just a black canvas. And it's the idea that art didn't have to be this kind of pictorial um, romantic idea. It could be, it could almost be nothing or it could be something normal or it could be yeah so that's that's really why the idea of blank canvas came from and now i now i say blank canvas whenever the tv's on someone always says blank canvas at some point in a you'll you, you be watching any program if you look and when you when you're kind of looking out for it you kind of you hear it all the time to be honest so. yeah, i suppose so well <laughs> it does definitely work well for for this book cool and leads me nicely um onto the book which i think we should uh, get into discussing mm. So I get the impression uh, that this is, you know, had a long gestation period and is, is part of research that you've been undertaking for some time or certainly a thought processes that, you know, perhaps not so spontaneous and have been yeah, considered over true. a long period of time. And, mm -hmm. and it's a really interesting historical document um, as well. Um, so why don't you tell us a bit more about the book? Where, where, where did it come from and what's the kind of what's the main aim and how would you sort of describe it, you know, initially? Yeah, I think the main aim is uh, looking at creative development in musicians and artists and thinking, is there another way of teaching it? Is there another way of education? So for me, I, I worked in music education from about the start of the 90s. So really early, you know, when pop music started as a thing, it was like the early 90s. And that was really for me when I started working in different places in, in Glasgow, Bristol, London, Bath, within pop music education. And it's really, I just, because I cross over loads of genres, I saw pop music was really being taught in a kind of classical mode, in a kind of conservatoire, quite, you know, with, with notes and with um, scores in a very traditional kind of way, you know, quite rigid. Whereas working in bands, working as a producer, you feel like, it, you know, it's a fluid process. You kind of, a lot of things are trial and error. A lot of things are about experimentation. A lot of things are about kind of just seeing what comes up in the mix and being trying to be different, trying to be conceptual. And I think I started trying out some of those ideas really from through the 90s and the early 2000s when I was at Bath College. And I sort of, you know, has had some success really with that with students and for me, that's that's kind of where the where the first things came from my the actual research started with my PhD in about 2016. So, you know, building on my history of my ideas, I was a late, late comer to uh, doing a PhD at just before the age of 50. And um, yeah, so it's, that was, that just kind of provided me with the space and the opportunity to, to, to do the research in more depth and then lead on to the book from that, that point really. And the research itself, it explores the impact of UK art schools on mm. popular musicians um, and how specific education philosophies and practices have impacted the creativity of a wide range of different musicians and producers. Mm. Um, and I, I know it's something that I kind of have been involved in and have had awareness in my own personal life. And, and that people have definitely touched upon you know, aspects of this previously, but this truly is like a, a real step forward in this in this research. Um, and clearly comes from a really mindful place as well. Yeah. Um, so yeah, well, tell us a bit about the way that you, you how you went about organising it, because it's like a, yeah. such a such a lot more. Well, so many examples, um, which I mean, again, maybe you could yeah. highlight in a minute some of the how many musicians and how many of these beloved bands came out of mm. this UK art school scene, but also how that you know the book obviously discusses the lineage of that and and the mm. legacy of. Bauhaus and legacy yeah. of like New York and, and, and America yeah. and, and other places that have led to then this kind of development of art schools in the UK and how that in turn then create the creative space for, for to create musicians or creatives mm. um, in these creative kind of like silos, if you will, these art schools, which we all kind of take a bit for granted now. But I think especially in like the 70s, 80s, and 90s, these were quite important you know, places um, and, and for, for, for the gestation of different music and genres. So yeah, just, yeah. Just tell, tell tell us a bit more about how the how you organised the book and, and and about maybe how Bauhaus and things kind of led in the trajectory. Yeah, that's yeah. I mean, I I put it into three sections. Um, so the first one is the first part is quite historical. Hopefully, I think it's a book you can either read. I've been doing a book tour at the moment, and it's quite interesting how different people 
the early kind of feel about how different people get hold of the book. So some people will read it from start to end. I think it's a book I would read from start to the end, and then I would probably dip into it. Other people are just going to dip into it at certain bits and really pick out the bits that kind of talk to them first before they then go for the whole thing, because there is a lot of content in that book, I think. Um, so the first the first section is historical. So it's looking at the Bauhaus as the key school from, from Germany in the early 20th century. Then it goes on to Black Mountain Cal College, an amazing, really a great, interesting place. People like um, Robert De Niro, anyone called Robert actually went to yeah. Black Mountain College. So it, was, it, was, it was totally new for me, this actually, the, the yeah. Black Mountain College. I learned a lot from reading the book on, on, on the impact yeah. of that school. Yeah, it's incredible. There was actually an exhibition in Bristol in the early 2000s about Black Mountain College, but it was at the yeah. Arnold Fili. But um, okay. I didn't know much about it either, really. And But it's like there was a thousand students there and it went from 1933 to 1956. And it was an incredible place in that it was built by the students and the tutors together. There was It was very much a kind of communal, commune kind of space. There was a lot of very, you know, John Cage was a teacher, Merce Cunningham. Um, yeah, a lot, of, a lot of kind of well-known artists and musicians and theatrical people were, were tutors at the time. But then, you know, so Robert De Niro, Robert Motherwell, Robert Rauschenberg, um came through some of the people that came through black mountain college and it was really a kind of ex taking those Bauhaus ideas and giving it a little bit more of an experimental kind of edge um as as the world kind of developed in the 50s and that whole idea like you said about the new york school and the um, minimalist ideas that came through in the 50s i think black mountain college was a key element and then it, in a way it was really the template for the UK art schools. So they were taking that the ideas that came from the Bauhaus and Black Mountain College and the New York School into the UK art schools. And the 60s and 70s was just really a kind of hotbed of those places. I think the thing to remember is that not all art schools in the UK in the 60s and 70s were radical, were yeah. kind of the key, you know, there's obviously, I think there was a hundred and maybe 120 old art schools in the 60s. That gradually petered down as they became polytechnics and universities. But they were they all had their own kind of like, in the very individual, they were allowed by the government to have their own individual kind of emphasis. So if you wanted to be a conceptual art school with radical ideas, you could be. So, and it was really in those that kind of, the, what I noticed in my early research was that the, it was those more radical schools where a lot of the pop musicians came from. Right. So, you know, you're talking Hornsey, Ipswich, Newcastle, Leeds, um, Cambridge, um, even Bath, uh, a mixture. So, yeah, a mixture. Um, St. Martin's in London, Cardiff, Nottingham. So these these places were kind of, you know, the hotbeds of where these musicians, the main musicians came from, who kind of exploded through art school. The people that people will know, obviously, about the Beatles and Rolling Stones and the Kinks and those kind of bands coming through art school, which is great. For me, the people that really kind of informed this, the a lot of they, these obviously helped to inform the music scenes that came. Yeah. But those stories are quite well known, whereas I think obviously bands like Roxy Music and was a you know that was a massive key influence onto the scenes that came and so you know you've got brian eno brian ferry all those people someone um called rita donor who's actually who was at um teaching at reading she was one of the she was a girlfriend of brian eno but she was a key coordinator of the fashion and the style of roxy music and she's like, and she was married to Richard Hamilton, who's a famous conceptual artist. So he, her story was kind of, it's almost like an untold story. Hers is definitely an untold story. And yeah. I think there's a lot of those untold stories that started to emerge through the research. Definitely yeah. then, and I think you you definitely illuminate some of those untold stories through the book. And, right. Right. Um, and it's, it's interesting as well, because like for me, as someone who knows a lot of the bands, but maybe not, and, and, and knows the impact of art schools to some degree, but I'm no expert. I would imagine like Roxy Music would have come out of that scene, and and but then yeah. that's the benefit of hindsight and yeah. seeing the impact, the impact yeah. that they've had on contemporary music today, yeah. and 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 obviously yeah. in the last sort of thirty odd years. 
but yeah the whole uh the beatles and the rolling stones side of it was actually quite new to me and uh, right. the, the the historical lineage of these you know schools from outside of the uk and their impact was really interesting too yeah. um so that was all quite illuminating for me and i think that's something that a lot of people are going to find very interesting yeah i picked up the book expecting it to be like stories of you know what, what went on at art school and how people were having these creative inter intersections and you know and it was all going to be super cool and everything which it is but that's like a different part of the book yeah um, and that speaks to the way that people might read it because i think i was went into it and i had a practical necessity mm. because of presenting it to our distributor back mm. in the day but i went and looked for chapters and things i knew and things that i think would be would be good saliable points um that i could present to our sales team and then from there i was like well hang on a minute and then going back and then reading the whole history and and oh, finding out all these new new facts mm. and figures and things that i wasn't ever privy to so it really is a very important book i think in terms of the, the history um not only of art education or creative education in the uk but yeah. what led to that and, and 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 what came from it as well yeah um, there's definitely there's the, the news that i think for me like so i interviewed um amongst the people so brian eno um gavin Bryars, who's an experimental composer you know a lot of the female artists that came through so um from like the raincoats gina birch and anna the silver and and such like i also interviewed bill drummond from the klf so yeah. bill and bill drummond he can't he wrote he wrote a play basically he doesn't do interviews but he wrote he wrote he writes plays for projects he's interested in so he wrote oh. me a play oh wow <laughs> yeah he wrote me a play it was, it was actually is in is he's just released a book called paint and he, we've done a swap so we've done a book swap between me and bill drummond awesome paint for blank canvas and he's he so he wrote me a play and it he, but really interestingly he talked about that idea about minimalism on one side from art schools but also the kind of ska dub reggae side which influenced art schools as well right not just coventry where a lot of that came from but it was also the kind of people the a lot of people at art school were very much into reggae and into ska into those kind of those kind of uh, music scenes and he saw it that intersection between minimalism and dub and reggae as the thing which then led on uh, to new wave and beyond to all those music genres from beyond really interesting uh well it'd be quite interesting yeah. here a perspective on how that happened but would you would you mm. say i mean i guess i guess my conception would be i would think of art schools at that time in the uk mm. being quite white and would i be yeah. correct in that assumption um, yeah. but, yeah but then, but then to but 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 then it sounds like there's been a lot, a lot of influence out you know yeah that's that's a good question i mean i interviewed barry adamson he's the bass player from magazine and nick cave and visage he was the only black male person i interviewed i did had some emails with um pauline black from selector yeah they both said that it was very very white it was very weirdly art school was seemed to be not pretty classless in that it was very mixed class interesting. that's interesting yeah. very mixed gender although there was lots of gender pressures from like male a lot of male um teachers which is really yeah some really kind of quite horrific stories around that but oh yeah around around kind of race it's yeah there was interesting stories in london around the kind of like um portobello road art scene and jamaican art scene that some of that influenced and went into schools like st martin's and chelsea and wimbledon but really yeah it was you know barry adamson was a black artist at stockport art school in the 70s and he was pretty much on his own Wow, yeah. he felt very much on his own so that's even though there was that influence of black identified music the, it was it was very white centric yeah yeah do you just uh jumping around a bit i really want to get into some of the interview questions but i know we have limited yeah. time so but um with well with well with regard to 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 the way things are now yeah do you think the politically culturally is there a space for the same kind of creative opportunities in universities and, and art schools in the uk or is this kind of of a specific mm. albeit a long historical period mm. do you think this is something that's done and dusted and now creativity is uh, inhabiting virtual spaces and um 
and you know the internet and 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 you know um, i guess more more contemporary scenes are evolving around technology and around different kinds of spaces or do you think universities and art schools still have their place in in creative formation i think they do i think i think it will go in waves i i i mean yeah my temptation is to blow is to is to say like what you said and go like oh no that was a that was a point in time there's some ideas you can take and things like that but i think yeah it, it just depends a lot of it is a very political and you know the art schools in the 60s they they came from a specific kind of political agenda whereas they were the art schools were tried to be the government tried to make the art schools much more rigid and give them kind of like things they had hoops they had to jump through but they right. gave them autonomy uh, okay. you know, there was like an element of trust there was an element of trust and i think it's that element of trust and it's all about government if you have a government or you have a system that trusts individuals within within something so if you've got that kind of it's like i took in a way in within a canvas you've got that idea about within something that's organized you can kind of the chaos is allowed to freedom to run and i think if you can kind of have trust within education systems then then you can trust the autonomy of somewhere like say like bath you know is an amazing head teacher and they've got these experimental ideas give them the trust and i think that could happen that could happen but it you know it might be a generational thing it might be something that happens 20 years down the line i do think universities have a place for artistic development with musicians in that you know record companies haven't got the money or that don't spend the same amount of money on artistic development so i see universities as an a and r space which is is an issue if universities are going to be like pumping out quite acts who are quite similar so they might be mm. quite kind of safe right whereas i think in that in that era i mean money is always the thing isn't it you know in that era you had squatting you had a grant you had record companies with money you know yeah imagine being an art school if you're an art school musician you basically got a grant you're probably squatting you've got like a record company supporting you you've got like loads of peers you haven't got any pr those kind of yeah. like noise from the internet or other things going on it's all very much about your scenes in your areas like the scenes were small yeah right if you were a band in the 70s you got signed because it's like you know most bands got signed because there weren't too many there weren't that many bands and there was lots of you know the record companies were really expanding yeah so yeah it's complete opposite now and it's saturated market online yeah, yeah definitely yeah. Uh, that's uh it's that's that's that you've actually yeah drawn some interesting points there though okay make me think about um well look you are you it sounds like you're clearly um a fan or have been involved in some of these scenes as well is that fair to say and i think that you're really looking in the book i mean obviously a, a lot of the linears that leads to it but you're quite looking at punk post-punk new wave mm. those kind of genres you, is, would you say that's safe to say you're kind of a fan of those i don't know about the word fan yeah. <laughs> <Brian> <laughs> and i had that chat about the not liking the un, i mean being unsure about the word fan that's um it. I like, yeah, they're jo I mean, I like all kinds of genres. So I do like, I was brought up with punk, my brother being into punk. I was probably just a little bit young yeah. for punk. So I'm kind of post-punk. I see that kind of post-punk, end of the 70s, start of the 80s, into New Wave as my real, as the real kind of time when it, the music took off for me. But it was, you know, it's massively exciting from what had happened before. Yeah. It was experimental, interesting, exciting, daring, so a lot of those bands like the bat is the good thing was the people that i interviewed were the kind of people that i was into at the time That's so cool, like right. from brian you know to the monochrome set to the raincoats to cabaret voltaire to yeah you know, visage Th these are bands that i to magazine these are bands that i was completely into and you know my don't think my brother can still believe that i was actually interviewing these people that we were into, yeah, right. you know as teenagers so that is it's a really not i like that i like that fact you know um yeah what about with regard you've interviewed dozens of people and there are so many references to people um it'd be you know were there any that really stood out for you as being like wow i won't you know maybe a, not, not quite a wayne's world moment but you know yeah. um or or 
and in addition were there any that kind of got away who turned down the you know who you really would have liked to have interviewed for the book um but were you know they, they wouldn't even write you a play <laughs> i think my well my girlfriend wanted me to um she wanted me to interview adam ann okay yeah <laughs> And which would have been great because he was at Hornsey with some of the people I interviewed, you know, some of the people from Madness and the Raincoats and stuff like that. Iconic, an iconic figure, of course. Iconic well. figure, yeah, and a, and a real key kind of um, key figure. Um, Malcolm McLaren would have been good, but he he, he died in 2009, I think, 2010. Um, Brian Eno was obviously, for me, you know, I've always been into kind of Bowie's music, talking heads Eno's own music so he's always been like a kind of yeah production god the way that he's kind of gone over music and art and his whole he can change the whole idea about production and band yeah. so yeah he's in it and and he worked with German artists like Harmonia and stuff like that yeah. so it's like I think he influenced you know he influenced the new wave scene in Germany across Europe the UK he was part of the no wave scene in New York. So he's such a massive influence. And, you know, I spent two hours with him, which was just, yeah. He, I mean, awesome. he basically, I, I I knew I had two hours with him. So I just, I said to him, you know, what was it about art school experience that kind of connected with your music? So I, he could, I just basically asked him the big question at the start so he could basically talk for like two hours and he can talk for two hours and he's very funny very nice he's been very supportive since but i to be honest i've enjoyed interviewing everyone equally i think there's you know alex michon who was the kind of um she worked with the clash as their fashion designer she was really interesting stephen malander from cabaret voltaire um keith levine who sadly died recently he's from public image limited an iconic guitar player um yeah and you know, Gay Black from the adverts. Helen Reddington's amazing. She's kind of a friend, but she's part of that punk scene in in Brighton. Um, Gina Birch, with Gina Birch from the Raincoats is having a complete renaissance. She's having like her, I think her single has been um, a listed by Six Music at the moment. Oh, she's, really? had, she's had a big art exhibition in London. So weirdly for her. So when I saw her a few years ago, she was like in a normal kind of frame in her career, but now she's absolutely exploding through art and music. So it's really interesting to see to see that happen again and see see how you know her the things that she was kind of well known from the at the start are kind of re they're coming back and she's she's just such a creative person that she can succeed in that era and she can succeed in this era even though there's like forty years gap between them. I, th I think that's an amazing story and she's she alongside um Leicester Square from the monochrome set and Helen they're coming to my Brixton um book launch on the 3rd of December so that should be an interesting conversation well look let's um let's let's talk a little bit about the book launch then as you've just yeah. mentioned it um yeah. well you know you as, as a true musician you know you're going on tour but <laughs> with, with 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 the book on this occasion um yeah so yeah yeah tell us tell us what What's the idea behind the tour? Where where, where are you going to uh, where where you're going to be? What locations oh. are you? What what are the venues? And where can people find out a bit more information if they were would choose to come and uh, hear you speak? Yeah, I mean they can find out from the intellect site. I think they put on all the all the sort of um, all the dates at the moment. It's, it's I think it's I like the word tour. It's kind of like it feels like it's been going on for like a year across kind of conferences and stuff like that already. Yeah, and. I've done, I'm basically doing a Southern tour at the moment of the UK. And then next year I'm going to do a kind of, I need to do, I, I want to do like a, a Northern tour, including Scotland yeah. and Ireland, and then expanding into Europe as well. So I want to go to Paris and Berlin. And it's, that's what I like about a book is that you kind of release it, but it doesn't need to be like, and I haven't got the time to just go on tour, Yeah, you know, go everywhere. It's not like being a rock star going for like a three, four month tour, you know, but I, the fact that you can kind of gradually go, go across to these different places. So at the moment I'm going to, tomorrow I'm going to Brighton. Then the week after I'm going to Exeter, then three in London. 
and then Southampton the week after that. Then next year, I'm going to go to like Sheffield, Leeds, Newcastle, because they're all very key art school. Yeah, right. I'm going to all the key art school locations, really. So then it's going to be Edinburgh, Glasgow, and Liverpool. Oh, awesome. And not um, and, and if people do want to find out more, um, well, yeah. about the tour itself, but of course the book, um, you can just go to intellectbooks.com. And if you just type in blank canvas, you'll be taken to a page which has a lot more information about the book, about Simon. Um, and then, of course, you can see all of the uh, all of the dates that are so far kind of been scheduled um, and confirmed. And you can you know, pick one there and, uh, and head along. And, and again, I think you can hear from this conversation just the passion that Simon has about the project, but also the knowledge. I think it'd be great to be one of those things where sometimes a book really does need to be, you know, with the yeah. author and imparting their, you know, their wisdom and, and and to talk about the some of the processes that went into it. So I think the tour is a great idea, and we've had some great success with a few of these books when people have taken them on tour. I think you reach a different audience. Mm. Mm. But talking about tours and challenges and things like that, with this book and the process of writing it, were there any distinct challenges? Uh, was there anything you found particularly difficult or, you know, in hindsight you would do differently? Oh, good question. I, I think the challenge in a way was was writing, it was trying to write the audience to write it for, I suppose, because it's, it, yeah. you know, it's, I think it's it's got so much content and detail, but trying to have it so it's accessible, I want it to be accessible to sort of the academic side, the public side. I see that, I mean, I see myself as nice. I'm an academic who, who likes kind of public facing material and very accessible material. I wanted the book to be not an academic general price. I wanted it to be cheaper. So I think some of those things was about writing it and about actually kind of getting all this information into a book that's accessible and the right size and had a story and a thread through it. Um, obviously finding all the interviewees and finding the nice balance of interviewees is always, is always a challenge, but they kind of snowball from each other. Them talking to each other about the project sort of helped me find, find the interviewees, I think. Thank you very much. Um, that, that's, uh, it's, it's yeah, quite quite a quite a challenge, I'm sure. Yeah. Um, just in general, especially with a book like this. But I think the, yeah. the subject matter you really do justice to, and I, I think you really have managed to find that balance between the academic and ticking enough of those boxes that it's considered a serious piece of research, which yeah. it very much is. But then also, you know, it not being bloody boring and it not being <laughs> verbose and yeah. and and you know and and dense to the point that you're kind of alienating people, yeah. you know, uh, who maybe haven't mm. got the academic language, even mm. though they're perfectly intelligent enough to read and understand yeah. the content. I wanted it to be playful because I mean, in the book, I don't know if you noticed, there are loads of lyrics. Yeah, yeah. And you know, it's it was fun for me to just you know just put put them in occasionally. So there's you know there's lyrics from velvet underground roxy even like duran duran probably level 42 a weird a weird mix of lyrics um from all over the place that just <laughs> i think in our heads we have lyrics from all kinds of things so as a writer you kind of like you yeah. have words yeah. already in your head and sometimes i'll be writing a sentence like i like actually that's i'm sure that's a lyric from a song it's, were there any that you uh i was going to say that I, i'm the same as you but were there any that you thought well i better just double check that I've not misquoted this, and then you were like, "Oh, hang on a minute, I, I've had that wrong for the last twenty-five years. It's actually oh, something yeah. completely different." That's always the case, and I, I try and keep it wrong. I think in the book, if I do yeah, I think that's good. It, I, I, yeah, I, I would sometimes check, but sometimes I would just kind of go, "I think that's what the lyric is." I think even though, even though I was saying that to the last few words in the book, actually, are a, are a mix <laughs> are a mashup of lyrics that I that I, yeah. So hopefully. <laughs> I mean, for me, I, I think someone said to me that you should always write a book that you want to read. So I think that's hopefully what I, I feel. I, I do feel like that. I really like I really like going back into it and exploring it. Well, that's an achievement in itself. A lot of people do not want to read their own book. again. <laughs> <laughs> good, good. Well, you know, you mentioned the lyrics here as well. Um, and we've mentioned a lot of artists. Um, I wanted to ask you maybe are there any albums or perhaps artists that have had a big influence on you or it could be songs you know whether in your early early you know, early life that really got you into yeah. particular genres or if they're just 
any albums that have had a great impact on you at any point in your life it's always good to kind of share those uh <laughs> those, those top fives or those lists yeah yeah oh I, lo I love it i've actually created a spotify playlist for the for oh, the yeah. book actually so you can go oh, cool. you can go on to um yeah you can go on to spotify we can you just type in blank canvas and my name and spotify and you'll, you'll come up with a blank canvas playlist oh brilliant so that includes bands that i've I think luckily I've written a book about bands I'm interested in, which is quite good. Um, so it was like um, Ian Jury and the Blockheads. Yeah. That, I mean, them, I mean, it's amazingly ahead of their time. I think mm. they were like a precursor for for punk. And so, yeah, their yeah. You Boots and Panties album, amazing. Um, that came from like pop art, but obviously Brian Eno and Low by David Bowie. So when I was at university in Bristol, low was like for me the album that i loved and really kind of because it was it's pop but it's also weird and electric yeah. experimental it's like it wasn't the david bowie i knew there was this first real departure right from from yeah. ziggy and what came before and that yeah. was the one that was recorded in in berlin yeah so we had the three albums recorded in berlin so it's heroes that and um the one i always forget <laughs> loaded maybe i mean uh -huh. yeah so that was the middle one. So it came after Heroes. So it was kind of like, I think they were all recorded in 1977. So we had a good year in 1977, um, David Bowie and Brian Eno. And Bowie used to go off and Eno would just play around and Bowie just would just let those things be in his album, basically. So they're yeah. half Brian Eno albums as well as being half. I think that not many people know how much Eno is in right. those albums. Loads. Um, oh, yeah so that's loads of him just messing around with simps and playing around in the studio half half of low is is eno um that one madness was one of the first albums i ever ever bought and again that was interesting the um what bill drummond said i also interviewed clive langer who was the producer of the first madness albums and i saw that as kind of i'm a trombone player so for me scar reggae those kind of things coming to a pop a pop kind of field was was amazing one of my early favorite albums from the 1980s was um my life in the bush of ghosts i don't know if you know that album no i don't think so so it's precursor to one of the talking heads albums um oh. remaining light and it was so it was basically eno and david byrne and it's loads of samples and really a lot of hip-hop came from that so a lot of hip-hop that followed in the 80s came from that album they were inspired by that album so again you know uh, sorry he's kind of influenced hip-hop as well there you go yeah most definitely with use of you know uh, synthesizers as well yeah yeah, uh, yeah and you yeah. do allude to that in the book as well which i think is something yeah. we've, kind of, we've kind of missed you do you do mention hip-hop and, and the influence of this art school yeah. sound yeah art. i think and, i think that's the hip-hop side of it is something i didn't explore Re I, I mean i mentioned bits of it in the book but it's not the side that i kind of look at that most but my next research is looking at hip-hop jungle um techno grime new jazz and looking at a whole range of things which followed on so yeah is, is that the creative creative spheres project yeah creative spheres so it's really looking at, at my position in some of those scenes and mm -hmm. sort of those scenes that were successful so my position as a slightly non-successful producer, but also being around these bands. So I was kind of part of the scenes in, it was in the Paris punk scene around some famous bands. I was in Bristol where Massive Attack and Portishead and that were coming through. I was in Glasgow when loads of indie bands came through. I was part of the London drum and bass scene when Goldie and all that came through. So oh, it's cool. just, I know a lot of those scenes, but I wasn't, a, you know, a, successful kind of person so i'm interested in that whole idea about being a kind of like i have in the book that chapter on non-musician i like i wouldn't necessarily call myself a non-musician but i kind of like that idea that there's all these people in these scenes that had really equally key parts but they're just yeah. they weren't commercially successful they weren't yeah. financially successful but all those people make these scenes work that's a very good point really a really interesting uh follow-up piece i think yeah yeah no i look forward to seeing what comes out of that project yeah um, i'm yeah i'm looking forward to doing all the yeah definitely that's all the research behind it 
Well, um, I know we're about out of time, but uh, yeah. are there any final thoughts you might have or anything else you'd just like to highlight? Anything you're working on otherwise? Yeah, I suppose it's, I mean, that's the projects I'm I'm working on mainly at the moment, as well as sort of music, music projects. Um, I do my own electronic music projects and I, I work running festivals and, and events as well um yeah that's that's it really but i, I mean with with blank canvas i kind of I, what i like about doing the tour is that you go to places and it is it is like a blank canvas it is it starts a conversation and everywhere i've gone to we almost haven't talked about the book yeah do you know what i mean it starts exactly. a conversation about yeah, yeah. the internet the one in bristol was about the with everyone on about the internet the difference between pre-internet and the internet I know tomorrow in, in Brighton, a lot of it's going to be like political around art school education and current education. And like the question you asked really, you know, can we go back to those times? I think and I think that's what I like about this is that you can expand on something that started off as that idea. So that might leave, you know, that's going to lead to other research and other ideas as well. So, yeah, that's 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 kind of what I'm doing, really. Awesome. Well, yeah. Simon, thank you very much for your time today. Thanks, Thanks for choosing to work with Intellect on what is an excellent and exciting project. So if anyone's um, out there wants to find out more, um, you can, Simon's got his own website and I think you can just Google Simon Strange. That's pretty much the first thing that comes up. Um, but also you can go to intellectbooks.com yeah. and you can search for Blank Canvas Art School Creativity from Punk to New Wave. Um, and you can find out a lot more about the book and about Simon there, including the dates that he'll be appearing on his uh Magical Mystery Tour uh, coming up over the next few months and then into next year and um, taking that more global, hopefully, anyway. But yeah, um, I just want to just just thank you so much again for your time. And um, Great. Thanks, James. I really appreciate it. Great. Cheers, man. Thank you. Cheers. Bye bye. Bye bye. bye, -bye.